thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's uh, always nice to be able to talk with people that want to improve their community and state. They're serious about it. They take their own personal time. Let me ask you to go into your packets and have a little uh, summary uh, that I prepared from the job together, and I'll be speaking uh, from that. What I'd like to do is talk about where we are, why we're here, and what we can do to get out of it, and ramp it up to 15 minutes. So, uh, let me get on with it. Where are we? Let's look at the front page of this little brochure. And the first thing you see here are six facts. Let's use jobs and trade as a surrogate for where our economy is. Uh, the, uh, this is, uh, I put these, uh, updated these numbers. I did this little thing for the uh, House Jobs Caucus, a bipartisan group. I updated the numbers for today. Uh, I don't have the Friday morning numbers of unemployment. This is the situation as it was in August. Unemployment, the real unemployment rate is 16.2% of the Americans. That means 25 million Americans who want a job can't find a job. The number of jobs in U.S. goods production, uh, that's manufacturing, logging, mining, and construction today is back where it was in 1958. When we take a look at the number of manufacturing jobs today, that's about 11 million manufacturing jobs, it's back where it was in May of 1941, as we were gearing up to fight World War II. The U.S. net trade deficit this year will be around $600 billion. Let me put that in perspective. Uh, in 1980, uh, the, trade debt, the trade accounts were balanced. Balance. We've been balanced uh, until uh, around 1980. This year, 600 billion. The president uses the number that each billion of trade is equal to 14,000 jobs. That means the trade deficit alone is the source of 8.4 million lost jobs. Let's just focus in on that. There is a major job loss right there. There's something we got to do something about. Second, or fifth, the net U.S. international investment position is about 2.7 trillion. It's probably a little higher uh, than that. In 1980, we were the world's largest creditor. By far, we're the world's largest debtor. But we have to pay that and we have to pay interest on that. And then the U.S. was create 28 million new jobs between now and the year 2018 <coughs> to employ all U.S. workers who want to work. That's at about a 4.5% unemployment rate. This is a tremendous task. We've had, we're a rich country, <coughs> we're a big economy, but we've had a serious reversal. And so the question comes to that of why are we in this predicament? In statistics, we have a concept called a type one and a type two era. The type one era is where you think something is true and it's not. And the type two era is where you don't think it's true, but it is. We've made a type one era, a big type one era in our analysis of the world economy. Our the focus of that era is we believe the rest of the world wants to use the same economic model that we do. We've made the assumption that the rest of the world wants market-based capitalism. They don't. What we have is today a situation in which there are basically three types of economic models in the world. In the English-speaking peoples, what we have is a rules-driven system. We set the rules, and within those rules, we expect the markets uh, to produce the outcomes. And we put in place things such as antitrust laws to enforce the rules, to make sure that people uh, will not 
gang up and engage in anti-predatory uh, practices. We have a, a European or a socialist model where you'll have uh, the state will own some industries or the state will subsidize certain industries such as Airbus uh, or you will also have some independent uh, industries. And then we have a third type of model and the most glaring example is by our principal uh, industrial competitor, and that's China. It is state capitalism. The means of production in China are owned by the state. They're state-owned enterprises. <coughs> the Chinese operate off five-year plans. China is now in its 12th five-year plans. And in those five-year plans, uh, what the Chinese do is they determine which industries do they want to be champions, which industries will be secondary, uh, which industries will receive monies, which industries will receive special tax breaks, and those industries get the focus. Another thing that's not, I think, commonly recognized, out of all of China industries, all of their profits go to the state at the end of the year. The Chinese government today holds $3.2 trillion of uh, dollars of assets. Now that is enough. The New York Stock Exchange is valued at about $13 billion a day. The Chinese have enough money to buy majority control of at least a third of the countries on the New York uh, Stock Exchange. But with these champion industries, with the state enterprise, what it really means is any company that is competing against a designated state champion is competing against the whole of the government of China. And in those kinds of circumstances, an individual country, no matter how rich, no matter their resources, ultimately don't have the problems. Now, we in the United States, I'm an economist, have been trained that you compete on the basis of five foundations. Price, quality, service, innovation, market. But when you're competing with state capitalism, there's a sixth dimension there. And that sixth dimension is the public policy. We can work our hearts out, bring in the best robotics, bring in new innovations. We can drive our prices down, but you can offset that by currency manipulation. You quite literally can cheapen your currency 20 or 30 percent, as the Chinese have done, and wipe that out. As to the question of service, you can, in a foreign market, a foreign government, uh, can deny you access. It can take a Federal Express and force you to do a three-day delivery instead of a one-day delivery, while the local company is permitted to do a one-day delivery. On the, same, on the situation of innovation, for example, what we now have is massive infringement, massive theft of U.S. intellectual property rights all over the world. The International Trade Commission did an estimate, and they estimate that the Chinese in the year 2009 did about $59 billion worth of intellectual property rights of American companies. In fact, American companies that go to China now are forced to share their technology with the Chinese, and if they make any improvements inside China, the Chinese own the American uh, technology. And as far as marketing, the Chinese and other governments uh, quite literally will make exclusions, exclusionary rules. The, this Korean free trade deal that will soon be voted on that Congress is an example of how not to negotiate a trade deal. Uh, think of this, <coughs> and this, the auto industry is important in this region. Under this trade deal, the Koreans are permitted to produce either here or import here an unlimited number of vehicles. Last year they did about a million vehicles. This trade deal caps U.S. exports China to 75,000 people, 75,000 a million. It's an unbalanced deal. This trade deal makes no provision for currency 
manipulation. It should make a, uh, an allowance for currency manipulation. Uh, we should never go into a deal where the government can use its central bank to wipe out our price competitiveness but simply by changing the value of the dollar. And then there is another dimension which Charlie uh, will speak to, and that is the way we tax. The way we tax is as important as how much we tax. 141 other countries do use a value-added tax. And under global trade rules, it is possible under a VAT for a government to rebate every dollar of the VAT that is uh, done on an export. Germany, for example, has a 19% VAT. Germany will export a $50,000 Mercedes-Benz to the United States. Mercedes-Benz will get a $10,000 rebate. So they're sending that car into the U.S. market for $40,000. Cadillac will send an Escalade, a $50,000 Escalade, into Germany, and it has to add 19% of the VAT. So the Cadillac suddenly becomes a $60,000 market. There's some opportunities here as to what to do if we'll be smart and not requiring an expenditure of federal monies that we can offset these uh, advantages. One thing that we can do, we can use our rights under the WTO, the World Trade Organization, to call a timeout on trade. We have an emergency. It's a, with 8 million jobs lost because of trade, we have an emergency. And we can take that emergency and say, hey, we're going to take a timeout on all of our trade obligations until such time as we can bring our accounts into balance. We can do it by either exporting more or importing uh, less. Richard Nixon used that in 1972, uh, 71, when we shifted from gold. Other countries use this all the time. We need to trade time out from these agreements to get our accounts into balance because we have an emergency. Let me give you another tax thought. The corporate income tax rates in the U.S. are the highest in the world, 35 percent. The effective rate is 5 or 6 percent in the U.S., given all the, uh, the loopholes uh, that exist here. One of the things that we can do is just make a great tax law. We're going to say we're going to eliminate totally the corporate income tax, and we're going to do a value-added tax that has effectively the same rate as the corporate taxes here, which would be 5 or 6 percent. And what you would suddenly find, no corporate income tax, none of the burdens, value-added tax, and guess what would happen? You'd produce the same amount of revenue plus an additional $300 billion. There's a series of other things that we can do. I point them out in this brochure. Many of them will cost nothing. What we've got to do recognize the nature of our problem and begin to deal with them in smart ways instead of traditional. Look forward to your questions.